Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Welcome to a very special session. Um, it's always special to join on a Saturday. But today, we actually have been leading up on our social media with a big announcement that we wanted to make. Um, people who received the weekly email probably already know a little bit about what I'm going to talk about. But um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a little bit of liberty to give a little bit of a lecture today. So <laughs> a little bit more than an introduction, not really. Um, but I'll try, try not to take too much time. So and I'm going a little old school, so I've got a little board here to, to help me. Um, so we have a very special announcement. It's something that has been in the works for a long time. And um, let me start by saying what the announcement is, because it's a little bit different. The intellectual revolution has the potential to begin. That's the announcement, that's the theme of my talk today, and I want to start by putting that out there and then starting with a little bit of history because I wanted to share, we're going to do a little bit of book talking, a little bit of history today. Um, so, you know, in, um, we've been doing this now for, you know, 20, almost 30 years um, in the world of books, in the you know, world of education and learning. Um, and our journey started, you know, back in, well, we met in 1995. Um, as far as book journeys are concerned, our book journey started with um, one of the Sheikh's first publications. This is called The Authoritative and Authoritarian in Islamic Discourses. Some of you may know this book. It's known as sort of the orange book. Um, it was published by MVI, which is a part of Islamic Center of Southern California. And this was a long time ago. The, this was before the, the Sheikh had his PhD from Princeton. Um, he was getting his PhD. He had finished all of his work. He was just writing his dissertation. And we were involved. We had you know, recently gotten married. And there was this, this uh, um, big to-do in the Muslim community. Um, the basketball player, Abdul Rauf, refused to stand for the national anthem one night when he was playing a basketball game. And this became a huge outroar because he claimed that, according to Islam, this would be wrong for him to stand up to the national anthem. And that triggered then a whole bunch of people coming out of the woodwork and issuing fatwas, you know, doctors, engineers, all kinds of people throwing around hadith that, you know, supposedly were the mic drop moment about why this was either true or not true. So it was a very interesting case study, and the sheikh took the opportunity to write just a little treatise. You can see it's really tiny and, you know, minimal, um, talking about this case study. Now, he wasn't there to, you know, say whether it was right or wrong, but what was really offensive is how people would just, what he called, hadith hurl. They would hurl hadiths around, um, and then make uh, Islamic pronouncements based on that. So he used that as a case study and that whole dynamic of what happened to talk about how do you actually deal with Islamic studies in, you know, in, a, in a proper way. And this term, you know, the authoritative versus authoritarian, was used to you know, describe what can be considered authoritary, uh, authoritative versus authoritarian. And as a side note, it's very interesting because before this book came out, no one ever used those terms, authoritative and authoritarian. But then shortly after, it became part of our regular vernacular. People would say, well, that's authoritative or not authoritative. But anyway, it started with this book. It started with a, a Muslim publisher. Um, and this book it was not, you know, it's like sort of typical of what we have come to associate with Muslim presses, which is not super high quality, like literally the way that it was published, you would read it once and it would fall apart. Um, and if you look at, you know, the cover is not particularly beautiful. Orange is not a particularly, you know, exciting color. Um, and if you look at the insides in terms of how, you know, it's laid out, it's, you know, it, it's not very professional. It's not on par with, you know, what you would get when you go to a bookstore and you consider buying, um, a, you know, a real book. Um, so this was the first to go at it. And despite the fact that it didn't look beautiful, it surprisingly made a lot of rounds, and it, the, the content was so powerful that people bought it, fell in love with it. We met students years later who would come and, you know, like when we were at uh, Texas many years later and did a book signing for a different book, people would come up with their orange copies, completely dog-eared, completely highlighted, falling apart, and they would come and say, I love this book, and I carry it around with me everywhere. And so it was amazing just the power of the content despite the presentation. Because this book was really valuable, um, and the content was really valuable, we decided to take another couple of tries with Muslim publishers because it's a Muslim, you know, it's a Muslim issue, and it's not something that can easily be published within a secular world. So this was take two, brown cover. This was Dar Taiba. Um, I believe they were out of maybe Jordan. Um, 
Rosella. Okay, well, anyway, uh, another country. Um, and so it, again, not super beautiful. When you open it up, it's the same kind of thing. It's like got that feel. You know, all people who've seen, you know, all Muslims know this this look, right? We have a lot of Muslim pamphlets, a lot of, you just know the minute you see it, what you're getting. Um, and, you know, we even had like, you know, a friend design this cover, but so, okay, you know, it was better. At least it didn't fall apart after you read it one time. So that was, so this was 1996. This one was 1997. This survived for a little bit. And then ultimately, take three. Another Muslim publisher, um, 2002. It's slightly better. The quality of the cover is a little bit better. The inside is laid out a little bit better. But again, it's not to the standard of what you would expect a typical high quality professional book. So, um, okay. So that was 2002 that that came out. Now, this, this was done without even uh, getting our permission. Right? Really? Yeah. Oh, okay. I thought that was, uh, oh, this was, okay. Sadawi. 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 I thought it was, that's not Khalid? That's Khalid, right? That's Khalid. Okay. That's not Khalid. All right. <laughs> so maybe it was done without permission. Well, we were happy because it was an improvement, but it was still, <laughs> like, not great. Okay. So, um, okay. So at that time, you know, like, Muslim publishers in general, you know, like, in a, I'll, I brought a few examples. Um, you know, Amana was a big publisher at the time. So now we're like at the 2000 mark. And, um, you know, we, we were interested at this point, you know, we, we'd been involved with the Song Center of Southern California and um, the chef had been writing these articles in a column called Conference of the Books. And they were published in this magazine called the Minaret Magazine, which is around for many years, but it was a publication um, of uh, the Islamic Center um, through their MBI, um, you know, publishing arm. Um, and so this collection of really wonderful um, essays, which now you know are part of the book Conference of the Books, were not collected. They were just published. And actually when the Sheikh and I met, it's very interesting, we met in um, early 1995 and he had just completed the very first um, chapter of that whole collection, which starts out, you know, in a small apartment outside of Princeton, New Jersey. So that's where, where, we, where I come into the picture. Um, and so by about the um, late 19, like 1999, 2000, we had a good critical mass and we thought these are really valuable. It would be amazing to collect them together as a book and get it published. So um, I put together that manuscript, I collected the articles, I put together a marketing plan and I decided, okay, I'm gonna try and send it out to all the different Muslim publishers and see if we can get it published. Um, and so, you know, I wrote, you know, like really nice kind of everything, whatever, you know, sent it out and one after another after another it was rejected and i remember that at that, that time the the big publishers um were fons vitae and okay so amana so this is a, a um, example of amana the cover again not beautiful um you open it up and it again has that sort of that same sort of ghettoized muslim feel um the best in the class was fons vitae which was this um which is you know it looks more professional, looks more academic. They're still around today. Interestingly, Fons Vitae now is not just a Muslim publisher, but they do interfaith. So they actually publish books from other traditions, probably as a means to survive, I'm guessing. Um, and then the other one that was um, what I would consider top of class was the Islamic Text Society, which looks like this. And they published a lot of books um, on Al Ghazali, and they're still around. And so um, this was probably the most, the closest. I mean, this to me is like on par with what you would get, you know, at an academic press. It's this is impressive, but they're out of the UK. But as far as the US, the, um, I think it was, you know, typical like Amana and a few other um, publishers um, that that I'm sure people know. So. All of those guys said no to conference of the books. So we said, okay, you know what? I know, I believe in this. Um, and so we'll just do it ourselves. And so we got in contact. I was aware of um, a publisher that was an imprint of Roman and Littlefield. Um, They're called University Press of America. Um, and this is a press that really existed for, um, you know, scholars who did really top notch work. Um, as I mentioned, maybe sometimes a bit esoteric. Um, but the, the um, you know, the work deserved to be published, but people just recognized that this is not going to make a lot of money. So it was an imprint that was dedicated to allowing scholars to publish their work, you know, with the expectation that, you know, it's, they're, they're not money making, but they're doing something good for scholarship. 
but they asked that you, in order to use their, their press, that you provide everything for them. So you had to go and get the text, you know, copy edited, laid out on a page, camera ready. You go and you get the cover. You basically do all the parts. You are the, you know, the work, the, the legwork. And then you, you deliver everything to them and you write all the marketing copy and all that sort of stuff. And then they do the finishing bit of, um, of publishing it as a book, and then their distribution was minimal. You know, I mean, they, they made it available on Roman and Littlefield, but um, they were not actively marketing it beyond just the basics of putting it in their catalog. So thus, the conference of the books was born. And you know, I remember finding this image. I remember finding the designer to create, you know, the um, the cover. I remember writing all the copy, um, and then finding the person to lay out the insides. And this was the first version of conference of the books. You know, we really wanted to make it a beautiful book. So if you know, every single chapter begins with, you know, a lovely um, Arabic calligraphy. Um, it's everything about it, you know, looks professional. And it was a really just a beautiful job. We made it in hardback, and then we also made it in paperback. Um, and so, um, alhamdulillah, it was born. And um, this was the first version, so um, this lived for, um, so it came out in 2001, um, and this lived until the next version came out, which was in 2006, and this version actually, um, it was lovely because Roman and Littlefield recognized that it was doing well, and they decided to republish it under their main, um, imp or their main uh, title. So it's actually, this is now published by Roman Littlefield itself, not University Press of America. Um, and so then this actually includes additional chapters that were written after the first one came out. So this has actually the complete set. And hopefully um, you guys have all read it because it's really amazing. So this process was really important for, for me from a learning perspective. And um, I, I found it, um, you know, it was, it was all new and really interesting, but I felt so relieved that we could actually create something beautiful. And the, the Sheikh had written another manuscript that I thought was just brilliant. Um, well, actually, it was this, the author, you know, it was the, the content in this book, um, which is that whole case study. Um, and I wanted him, um, you know, by this time a lot of things had transpired. This text had been out for a while. People had been talking about it. He has a few, um, you know, quotes and, and citations in there that were a little bit controversial about hijab and whatnot. So people were talking about it. Um, and a lot of things had happened, you know, and this was now post also 9-11. So, oh, sorry, no, not before this, but sorry, I'm getting my timeline off. It was not yet 9-11. But enough had happened that... Um, we felt it was a really good time for Sheikh to, you know, republish the meat of the authoritative and authoritarian and then add to it some commentary about what had happened since the first book was published. And so there was quite a lot to say. And so this book actually contains the total of this plus commentary and some really interesting insights. And this is like kind of, um, and we did this through the same UPA process. So actually, if you read in the introduction, it's kind of nice. He, he actually says, oh, you know, Grace kind of took it on and did it. And I just basically did the same thing here, got the cover design, got the image, did all the writing, you know, and all of that, and, and then it came out. Um, and it's such, um, and we've never really done marketing on this book, but it's been around since 19, you know, since, actually, okay, this came out 2001. So this came out in 2001, this came out in 2001. And it's survived, and it's made its way around, and it's been adopted in classes, and it's an incredible book because it's really like applied Sharia. And wonderfully speaking, you know, the Sheikh just gave the keynote to the National Muslim Law Students Association a few weekends back, and they decided to buy this book and give it to all the people that are in their organization, which is really powerful because this is like what you need to know about Islamic law. And Islamic law is not the same as being a Muslim and then teaching Islamic law without training. So. Um, so alhamdulillah, and you can see that they kind of have a nice, you know, feel about them. Um, interestingly, so that was 2001. We had two other books that came out in 2001 because these things, um, when you work with the Muslim press, they take different time, you know, they're different timelines, especially when you work at w working with a publishing company that's much larger, they have their own timelines and their own deadlines. And so interestingly, um, this was uh, Rebellion and Violence in Islamic Law came out in 2001. This was actually Sheikh's dissertation, and this was published by Cambridge. So, um, and that came out in a hardback and a paperback. And I just want to point it out because, you know, when you compare, once again, you know, like best in class of um, a Muslim press versus, you know, Cambridge, Oxford, you still see a significant difference. 
Um, and then the last book that came out in 2001 was Speaking in God's Name, and this was published by One World Press out of the UK. Um, and we, in both of these cases, we had really no input at all into the cover design. And so you can see that, you know, this has kind of an interesting image and some Arabic. Um, we, we had, I think, a, a little bit of maybe, we got to say like, okay, yeah, that's okay, we kind of like it, that's all right. But um, you kind of leave the design and the presentation of the book to um, you know someone who's not Muslim, and you know you you they may come up with something you like or they may not. Um, and now, actually, post 9/11, um, it becomes a little bit more um, a little more risky because you've got the impact of Islamophobia. This is an image of a, a woman teaching a class. It's uh, from the Islamic tradition. Awesome. <laughs> that. Actually, no, I did that. Okay. Um, so again, 2001. 2002, we had a couple of conversation books. Um, one is The Place of Tolerance in Islam, which was a situation where the, the sheikh would write an article and then they uh, then he was writing about tolerance, which was a big issue in, back in 2002. Um, and a lot, and then the this was the Boston Review. Is democracy book? Yeah, I meant to grab it. Um, I don't know if so, can you go down and grab uh, Islam and Challenge of Democracy. I was looking for the the one with the, the right cover. It might not be on the shrine, and but the yeah, it's orange and it's Princeton University Press. It came out around the same time, okay. but it was a, another conversation book again. So the the sheikh would write the first article. Um, that article would be sent out to a number of scholars who would then write their response to his article. Um, and then the sheikh would read all of those responses and then write a final response in response to all of those other articles. And so it was a very interesting way to see, um, you know, scholars weigh in on this argument, on this issue of tolerance. And the same thing um, happened on the issue of democracy. So that was Islam and the challenge of democracy. So again, you know, when this is like, if, I don't know if you can see this, but it's a bunch of women wearing white hijabs. This is a, presumably a hajj, right? Um, yeah. Uh, okay, well, I don't know. So it's a very, you know, stereotypical kind of thing. You know, when you think of Islam, oh, yeah, of course, you think of women wearing white hijabs, and, and not just one woman, but like a sea of women in white hijabs, right? So, um, and then I think the um, Islam and Democracy book was more, um, it wasn't people, but it was more like uh, some other kind of design. So when Ramin brings it up, we'll, we'll take a look. This is another book that came out from a Muslim publisher, um, Shattered Illusions, where Sheikh actually has an article, but it's just another example of a Muslim press. It's, it's better than most. It's Emil Press, um, which actually isn't even around anymore, but it was you know, a, a, a pretty good, um, a, a good presentation. And then 2005, after 9-11, this is The Great Theft came out in, um, again, after, um, this is a really important book. It was published by Harper San Francisco, um, and it was um, really the, the difference between, you know, people were talking a lot about moderate Muslims, and but yet no one had ever defined the term, you know, what is a moderate Muslim? And so um, the sheikh wrote this book that really, um, the first part of it gives you sort of the history and the rise of, um, thank you, I know, see, this is not, not the one, this is the hardback, but it doesn't show you the cover. Um, we actually, I, I couldn't find the other one, so maybe I'll show you another time. Um, I've never seen the hardback. Oh, okay. um, so this was the part one of this book gives you the whole history of the rise of Wahhabism, and so you understand like why Islam is, uh, or at that time was as crazy as it was with the, the you know infiltration of Wahhabi thought. Um, and then the second part of it was um, really in a, in a way it was the Sheikh's school of thought, but it was the difference between. Um, a moderate Muslim, uh, or you know, an extremist Muslim, and what we, he was defining as a moderate Muslim on all different aspects of theology and practice. And so it was a really valuable book that was um, adopted in a lot of classes. It's, um, the, the interesting history that I think I might have told about this is the first draft that was intended to be published um, for Great Theft was the was Reasoning with God, and he had written like a 400-page draft and handed it in to the people at um, Harper's, and they were like, what is this? We wanted a beach read. This is like so difficult. And then he, you know, and he thought he was dubbing it down, but it was too difficult for them. So instead he then took that text back and that sat for 10 years. And then he wrote this book in literally a month's time. So, and this was like to him the real dumbed down version, but for, for us mere mortals, it's an incredible book and a great education. So, but this again was a really important book after 9-11 uh, after to really, you know, indicate what, what are we talking about when we're talking about moderate Muslims? What does that look like? So, as I said, then this was 2006, and then 
came Reasoning with God, which was um, in 2014. So after this was turned down, uh, the original draft was turned down by Harper San Francisco. This sort of sat for 10 years. Um, the Sheikh would work on it. Times changed. Islamophobia took an incredible rise. Um, some of the stuff that he had written that he thought was dumbed down, he went back and you know worked it back to what he felt was was right. And for those of you who have read it, it's really like an intellectual autobiography. It's also really fascinating, deep um, insight into what has happened um, in you know in the world of Islam, um, the perceptions of Sharia, and all of that in, in one person's lifetime. And, and it's an incredible um, you know it's an incredible journey because it's it's academic, it's personal, it's philosophical, um, it's beautiful. Um, and so highly recommend that as well. And then the most recent um, under the Sheikh's name is this book, The Rutledge Handbook of Islamic Law, which is a collection of articles. Sheikh has a really powerful article in here and an introduction, but it's an invitation to a lot of scholars to weigh in on different aspects of, of Islamic law. And so this came out, I think, in either uh, 2020 or 2021. Oh, sorry, 2019. So. So that is kind of the history of like our um, interaction with the publishing world. And there was a lot of learning for me personally. All of this made me really feel like, oh my God, it would be really amazing for us to have our own press. Because when you're talking about, you know, like Muslim presses and what they produce, you feel frustrated and you feel like, okay, I don't really want to work with a Muslim press because I, you know, we, we want to be able to speak to the world and and you know and be, present ourselves in a, in a respectable manner, um, and then this also creates a challenge because then you're working mostly with secular publishers, so the Cambridges, the Oxfords, the you know, all of these you know big name publishers. They're obviously not necessarily interested in something that is grounded um, in in the tradition and unapologetically Muslim. You know we have we're talking about academic presses. Um, and, you know, and I have, we, you know, the, the Sheikh has written so much, he's said, you know, he's done so much that is so valuable. And I always felt like, you know, it would be amazing to have the ability to just create our own mechanism for, for publishing. Um, and, you know, in that time, obviously, as you know, the, the publishing world has completely changed. So, you know, self-publishing has taken off. Um, it's a lot easier to actually, you know, create stuff. Um, and so, um, you know, over time, um, I, this was always just a dream that I had, and you know, as I had mentioned in my my weekly email, you know, as things progressed and we in, you know created the Suli Institute and then we started doing virtual chutbas and whatnot, we just had this critical mass of amazing information that you know I felt shouldn't just live out there on YouTube um, or on SoundCloud, but that really needed to be published. So um, fast forward um, to 2019, um, and you know, Suli is now alive. We're doing halakas kind of on a monthly basis. We've been doing now chutbahs virtually since January of 2019. And Mr. Joe Linhoff um, sends me this beautiful email and you know, says, I, you know, I love your work and um, I would love to be able to help in any way that I can. And so we had several conversations and I told him about this idea of publishing you know, chutbahs. Um, and he thought it was an amazing idea, and so he said, "Okay, well, you know, I'm gonna—I I would love to do that. I'm a little busy, but I'm gonna try and get you know pass through what I need to do, and then I'm gonna focus on this." So I was like, "Okay, wonderful. You know, that's that would be fabulous." So you know, hadn't we got really busy with everything else? We got busy with Project Illumin and all of this kind of thing, and then one day last Ramadan, Joe shows up and he's like, "I've got a surprise for you. Here is the draft." And I was like, "Oh my God!" So that was a year ago this Ramadan. And then we were just um, excited to work on it. And, you know, I think we, we decided, okay, let's make it happen. Um, so, this is my learning part, the page, okay. So we then decided, okay, let's make it happen. Let's create a Suli Press. And let's think about what we want the first book to come out as. And, so this is the announcement, Prophet's Pulpit. Um, this is the collection of um, 22 of Sheikh's um, chutbahs, which are stunning. We spent a lot of time thinking about, you know, what did we want to present in the first book? Because this is the first book out the door. And if we want to prove ourselves as the Asuli Institute, as Asuli Press, it's got to be really good if it's going to go out there. It can't be, you know, like something like this. And we really wanted to create something that was beautiful, that someone would pick up and say, wow, that 
you know, that's really beautiful. That looks like a professional book. And then when you open it, again, it's beautiful. And you'll recognize we took the same um, approach of having these like Arabic calligraphy at the start of every chapter. Um, we took a lot of time to think about, okay, what did we want to include? Um, you know, and because uh, Sheikh obviously talks about a lot of different themes um, through his khutbahs. Um, and so our, our themes were um, from darkness to light, on love and building a relationship with God, keeping our faith in the modern day, on justice, and on gratitude and navigating hardship. So these are sort of the bigger themes. And then within that, we've got, you know, three to five chutbahs that are really powerhouse chutbahs. So if you've obviously sat through one of the chutbahs here, you know that Sheikh calls it as he sees it. He has no problem speaking truth to power. He talks about what's happening in the world. Um, it's, you know, what I called applied Islamic ethics. It's vibrant Islam. It's like what Islam is meant to be if you are an ethical Muslim that cares about this faith um, and cares more than just about prayer and ritual, but wa wanting to make a change for good in the world. I mean, it's one thing to have all of this incredible content available on a YouTube video, um, but we all know that the vast majority of people have a hard time watching a five minute excerpt, you know, much less sitting down and watching a one, two, three hour session. But those of us who have sat through those sessions, we know how valuable those are. And even most of, uh, most of Sheikh's khutbahs are an hour, give or take. So the fact that now we actually have it in a book is, is you know, the fact that it's in a different form means that you have a different way of, of accessing this information. You can read it, you can gift it, you can read it again and again, you can take your time, you can study it, you know, you can look things up. Um, and it's, you know, it, it, it's a completely different experience. And I have to say that this book is so special. Joe did an amazing job. When you open this, you know, it's a really difficult thing um, to listen to someone speak have that transcribed, because this is our process. We send everything to professional transcribers and we end up with a raw transcript. And so you see someone speaking, but to turn that raw transcript into something that you can read and that moves you and where you still hear the voice of the person speaking, that is an art form. And that was something that Joe really like honed in on and he just knocked it out of the park. So when you open this and you read it, not only does it, it's, it's clear, it's crisp, it's beautiful, but you hear the voice of Sheikh, and I think that's what's incredibly powerful. So kudos to Joe, kudos to Joe's team, because Joe, as you know, is the head of our, um, he's the editor-in-chief of our Project Illumin transcription team. This is the crew that is getting us on the road to publishing the entire tefsir. So that's another process, you know, we, every, um, every halakha that we have, we send it to the raw um, you know, to the transcribers, we get the raw transcription. Joe's team takes that raw transcription, you know, works with it to clean it up and to get it a really good first pass um, so that by the time we reach our, inshallah, 114th surah, then we have, like, you know, we've got a good first draft of all the other things that came before. It would have been way too daunting if we didn't, you know, start that editing process until we were done with the halakas. Then you would have, a, like, 114 chapters and it would be, it would kill you. So Joe has done an amazing job um, with a, a team of, I think, seven or eight transcribers. And again, I have to just give my, you know, absolute kudos to this transcription team. These guys are hardworking. They're dedicated. They're not even here in person. They're, like, located all around, you know, whether it's the world, uh, around the U.S. Um, they're, you know, connected to us, but they have spent countless hours, um, you know, working through a process. Joe has, you know, a you know, very clear vision for how, um, you know, what process to follow, both in terms of, like, um, how we handle the text and how we preserve what the sheikh is saying, how do you preserve that voice. So um, the fact that they were able to get, you know, keep up the work and give Joe a little bit of time to focus on this is huge. Now this book was really intended for um, several different things. One, it's like one out the gate, so it's now proof of a suli. Okay, like what are you guys really about? What are you able to produce? Um, and it was a learning curve for us in preparation for this incredible tafsir that we want to take on. Um, and it was trying to create a process so that when we have other things that we're ready to publish, that we, we have it ready to go on a dime. So we already have volume two and volume three in the works because um, we have you know, a whole uh, inventory of amazing khutbahs. Um, we are working on a few other projects that will come out over time, but it's a really exciting thing. Um, what's really 
What I want to talk about today, though, I mean, it's like, you know, I wanted to give you the history and I wanted to tell you how we arrived here. But I also wanted to talk about how, to me, this is so much more than just a publication of a book. Because this book becomes a symbol and, you know, and proof for what we are able to accomplish as Muslims when we talk about, you know, an intellectual revolution. So, um, let me go on to here. You know, in terms, of, there's a lot of learning that you know over the last 20, 20, 30 years through this whole process um, that has really come together in finally arriving at the Prophet's pulpit. First, obviously, is that sadly Muslim presses are the worst. I mean, they just really are. There's just no two ways about it um, in terms of the quality of output, in terms of the professionalism and dealing with um, writers, the aesthetics, um, even the content. Um, and I think anyone who's picked up a, a Muslim book, unfortunately, knows that for the vast majority, with you know a few exceptions at the top of class, that as a, as you know an, as a group of people, Muslim presses are sadly the worst. Um, and in terms of even speed to market, um, you know most are not peer reviewed. They just are not up to up to snuff and not competitive with the mainstream. I mean that's really the bottom line. Um, and secondly, secular presses have the quality but they don't have necessarily the conviction, right? So you're not going to necessarily, uh, you know, you can't publish necessarily something like Conference of the Books or the Prophet's Pulpit, you know, a bunch of like sermons. Um, it, it's going to be hard, especially in this age of Islamophobia. And really interesting, as a side note, um, I was mentioning, you know, in part of like categorizing this book, like there's a lot that goes into like telling, you know, your publisher, okay, what kind of book is this? Does it fall into religion? Does it fall into um, ethics? Does it fall into Islam? Um, and you learn that there are these categories that you can choose from. Interesting, interestingly, there is a category for religion, sermons, and then subcategory, Christian and Jewish but zero were for Islamic sermons. So this is like kind of the first thing. That was very interesting. Um, and, you know, I learned a lot also um, working with secular designers because, you know, first of all, you know, whether you, you have an opportunity or not to weigh in really depends on your relationship with the publisher um, and, the, you know, and even just an individual, whether they're going to allow you to weigh in. So for Reasoning with God, for example, I was the one who was able to find this imagery and then they allowed you know, uh, us to present that imagery and then they worked with the final form. So um, you see like, you know, or in some cases you have like no input at all um, or you know, um, like this, no input at all. So of course you've got a whole bunch of men standing there praying, kind of a very typical image. We didn't really like this image but we really didn't have a whole lot to say about it. And even the title, The Great Theft, that was their title and not one that we necessarily really liked. But it was capturing what was happening at the moment, um, you know, in an Islamophobic world, people wondering what's happening with, you know, extremism. So, you know, it was a really interesting um, learning because um, your experiences with secular presses, while they have the ability to create quality product, it's going to be a little bit hit or miss when it comes to like what you're trying to convey as a Muslim and as, um, you know, an unapologetic Muslim. Um, and then lastly, you know, like when you walk into the bookstore, like this is my constant pet peeve, we would, we would all often go to the bookstore like every weekend. Um, and now if you walk into a Barnes & Noble or any bookstore, go and see what is the Islam section. What does it look like? It's really, really depressing. I've taken pictures I've posted on social media. Um, the Barnes & Noble here in, in Columbus, Ohio, um, which is typical of many Barnes & Nobles we've been to, even in LA, you walk in and you've got rows and rows of Christianity, Catholicism, Judaism, and the Islamic section is literally no more than that. One shelf. And consistently, it consists of this much in terms of the Quran, you might have like three different Qurans, and then I've seen Reza Eslan's No God But God, and then the rest is Islamophobia, Hershey Ali. And it's, you, you will have some you know, combination of that. And for the second largest religion in the world that has issues about Islam and all of that, 
this is ridiculous. But what it conveys is one that Muslims don't buy books. They don't spend money on books, and this is not a, a source of income for people who, who publish and sell books. And so they will put out there what people will buy. Um, and so, you know, and then in terms of like quality, well, okay, if I have to choose between, you know, these, um, I'm gonna choose books that on Islam that come out from presses that look professional. And, you know, and those a lot of times are not the best books for, for guiding seekers and, you know, for representing Islam as, as it should be. Um, so what ends up happening in terms of all of these dynamics, um, poor quality books, poor quality publications, um, lack of financial investment, consequences are that Muslims don't control their narrative, as we know. Um, Muslim voices are, are not heard. Um, their issues are you know, not clear to people. Um, there's no means of educating common people, anyone who even is interested in Islam. It's very difficult for, for them to find books or to know what books are good. Um, and that Muslims ultimately wield no financial power um, in this, in this you know, backdrop. Um, there are no high quality books or very few quality books. Um, and that others, like Islamophobes, will control the narrative. Um, and then as far as Muslim presses, there's no respect from, um, you know, fellow publishers. Um, the whole Muslim publishing space becomes very ghettoized, um, and there are no consistent quality standards. Now, we know from our work here that the jihad of our day and age is ideas and knowledge and communication. And so that is why it is extremely important. Like this book and this publication and Asuli Press represents so much more. So to sum it up, you know, when you try and take a look at what are the elements of success of a good book, you know, content is of course extremely important. The cover, how it presents, is it beautiful? Is it appealing? Is it something that you want to pick up and look at? For our purposes, conviction. You know, what does it say about our faith? Or is it apologetic or is it not apologetic? And ultimately, distribution. You know, is it going to get around? And when you look down this level, so I'm, I've got Muslim publishers, secular publishers, and a Sulli. For Muslims, you know, we don't always know that the content is very good. Most times, often, it's not. It's very, a lot of it was very Wahhabi for very long. The cover is obviously not great. Conviction is there, sure. Distribution, I don't know. I mean, maybe just ghettoized and among Muslims, it might be OK. Secular, they've got the content. They've got the cover. But they don't, they don't have the conviction necessarily, and they definitely have the distribution. For Suli Press, with this, with the Prophet's Pulpit, we have definitely the content. It's amazing if you read it. It's incredible. The cover, I honestly think it's a beautiful cover. We obviously have the conviction. Um, and you know, just to say, like, how do I define um, you know, like a high-quality book? Um, in terms of Muslim terms, it's, you know, obviously it has to be aesthetically pleasing, that it's got to be rigorously sound, um, and unapologetically Muslim. Because a lot of Muslim books, um, although they might be really good, they're very apologetic. Um, so, you know, the last question then is distribution. And that is really then what brings me to um, my, now I'm going to, like be a little bit like convert zealy, and so forgive me. <laughs> I like go a little nuts because, you know, this is like we talk so much here about who controls the narrative. Um, you know, how do we make a change? Like I am so sick and tired and done with being with people thinking Muslims are backwards and stupid and um, can't be on par with mainstream. We absolutely can do this, and this book to me is proof of that. Um, I wanted to be able to compete with other academic presses. I can go forward and say, you know, what's in this book is, is empowerment. This is empowerment in a book. It's, you know, speaking truth to power. Everything that Sheikh says about, you know, the UAE and Saudi Arabia and Egypt and, you know, the backwardsness of Muslim, you know, spaces here in America, it's all here. We didn't edit any of that out. Um, it's applied Islamic ethics. It's Quranic exegesis. It's what we do here. It's like, what is God's book telling us to do? Um, and how do we do it? 
you know, right? So every single week, Sheikh gets up and talks about what's happening in the world. And he tells us, you know, if you're an ethical Muslim, this is how, what you should feel. Yes, we live in dark times, but this is what, if you as an individual, it's up to your individual choice. This is how we make the change. If God feels that we are willing in our hearts to, you know, do the right thing and stand up to justice, then God will help. But the, until we get there, there's not, we're, we're going to be in, in darkness. Um, and I, what I love about what we do here that is, I think, different than a lot of other Muslim, you know, scholars, presses, organizations, is we focus not just on the trees. I think a lot of people get lost in the trees and they don't see the forest for the trees. So, you know, I, I question like who has a real comprehensive view? Like, I, you know, I'm on social media, I look at books and things. People are having debates about hadith, people are having debates about, you know, this tradition, that approach, that school of thought, blah, blah, blah. It's like all tree stuff. You're missing the forest. And I feel like what we provide here, what Sheikh provides to us, is truly when you talk about a way forward, a methodology, an applied way of living. And that's what people are looking for. You know, even like a Yakin Institute, I was looking at um, some of their, their stuff and, and their approach is, you know, we come up with good questions that are interesting and important and we ask scholars to weigh in on these questions, and then we make it easy for you to access. So you can look at infographics, you can you know, approach it through this, that, the other thing. But it's not a methodology. It's not a way forward. It's not a comprehensive view. If you don't know up from down or right, you know, then answering one or two questions is not going to get you a way forward. But that's what this does. And, that's, um, you know, and so the fact that now, if we are press and we can control the quality of content, and you know Suli content is second to none, we have a great cover, we have conviction, and we are not apologetic, we are not, you know, we know our job is to testify and, you know, speak truth to power. All that's left is distribution. And what I ask, you know, so now we're available on Amazon, alhamdulillah, right about an hour or two before the Salika, the hardback went live, so you can get the paperback now. The hardback is, um, you can order it. We have an ebook in process. And then we also are working um, with uh, distributors, so it'll be available, hopefully, um, in brick and mortar stores. So in, you know, Barnes and Noble and whatnot. Um, so, and I'm praying and hoping that, you know, that some of these bookstores will, will pick it up. But what makes a difference is now all of you. So we've done the hard work of creating this incredible product and making it available. And now what I ask all of you is to join this cause. And let's, if you're done with looking, you know, with Muslims being thought of as stupid and backwards, join me. And let me just share with you. So if, you, if anyone's familiar with this book by Malcolm Gladwell called The Tipping Point, um, or you know, there's another book called Contagious. You know, these are books are, that talk about the dynamic of how ideas take hold, how they become contagious, how they get set on fire. Things come to a tipping point, and once they, once they get past the tipping point, poof, they explode. And that's what I want for this book, because this book is now, to me, best in class. If you can find a book that's better than this, show me, I want to see it. And, but that's great, I hope so. Um, but from, my, from where we're sitting, this is the best book from that quality standard, unapologetically Muslim, beautiful inside and out. So now, this is a symbol that you can share with your friends, your non-Muslim friends, your Muslim friends, your Muslim friends who don't understand what the heck you're doing, or why people should care about a Suli, or why Hamza Yusuf isn't you know, good enough, or why Omar Suleiman isn't good enough. Here it is. Use this as your Ayyid present. Give it to every single person you know, and I don't care if they read it, I just want them to see it. I just want them to know that it exists. I just want them to know that somebody is doing something that can be taken seriously. And interestingly, I mean, we talk a lot about, um, you know, where is the change going to come? And it's really interesting, Sahar Aziz, Professor Sahar Aziz came and spoke in Dr. Abul Fadl's Muslims Race and Law class this week. And it became really clear to me when she was talking about her family, you know, she came from Egypt, her parents came, um, you know, and like so many families, they were looking for a better life. And, um, but she made this comment, you know, my parents said, you know, we are not here to change the problems in America. If we wanted to change things, we would have stayed back home and fixed things there because they consider themselves guests in America. And so they are not interested in issues of racism or, you know, gender issues or wealth and, you know, disparities or, or any of the social justice issues because they feel like they're guests here. 
So who are the people that care? They're the people that are probably second and third generation. And oftentimes we know people who reach the third generation are not really Muslim anymore. They're the ones that say, yeah, my, Muslim, my parents were Muslim, but you know, they don't have the language. Um, but, but they feel that America is their home. And they're the ones that actually can make the change. So when we talk about who are the Muslims that are smart, that care, that are social justice oriented, that are curious about the Quran, probably everyone in this room you know, is two degrees of separation from everyone in America or in the West who falls into that category. So between us, if we can get this book in the hands of every Muslim academic, influencer, activist, anyone who cares, we can start to hopefully get to that tipping point and try and make a change. So all I ask is just buy a book for your friends, you know, and um, give it away. Just make it, you know, tell them to put it on their coffee table. It's so pretty. You could frame it. You know, I don't care. You don't have to read it. Just get it out there so that it makes an impact so people see it. Their awareness rises. Um, and then that can be the start of change. And I really believe that if, if you know, if we want to make a difference, this is a great first step. And, you know, and inshallah, may God accept and help us. That's what makes, you know, so many things don't make it to the tipping point. They don't catch fire. And that's where I feel like if we take the effort and God sees it, then God can push it over the tipping point. And that can start to, to make things change very, very quickly. And if that is the case, instead of having the potential to begin, we can then say the intellectual revolution has begun. Um, you know, like, on a personal note, I thought I would share this. Um, a lot of people here have heard my story about, you know, my, my family, my conversion, um, how my parents um, and I were, you know, when I was really uh, estranged from them for eight years and how difficult it was. Um, so one of the very first things that I did when, when this book came online and was available to buy, like literally just this week, like several days ago, I bought it, two copies, one for my mom and my dad. And they got it actually even before we did here, so just the way that the distribution worked. And so my, I called my mom and I'm like, okay, I'm sending you a gift today, did you get it? She's like, oh yeah, we got it. We got it like a couple hours ago, we've been reading it. I'm like, oh, you didn't call me. <laughs> so, but I'm like, okay, what do you think? And she said, you know, your father said to me, um, I can't believe we have a daughter that could do this. You know, we've done nothing. Maybe our only purpose was to have a daughter that could actually do this. And then he wrote me a text message a couple nights ago, and he said, I think what you and Khaled have done is absolutely amazing. Um, I don't think anyone else could have done it. Um, and he's like, how many more volumes are coming out? When are the next ones coming out? <laughs> if you know anything about my story, like, you know, years ago when I converted, I literally thought I would never, I, it's like I was done. Like my parents, you know, disowned me. I, you know, was ready to just see them on the final day, you know, and then this is like a Ramadan miracle. This is a Ramadan miracle. Sully Press is a Ramadan miracle. And then to get a message like that from my parents um, is truly a miracle. And so anything, you know, can change very quickly. And I think that if we put in the work, we, the change can come from here because I just don't see that the, the content that's out there um, doesn't compare to the stuff we do here. You know, other Muslims are not interested in figuring out what the Quran has to say. And you know, this is just dovetails with all the work we're doing with the Holocaust. How can you be Muslim if you don't know what your, your book says? And, and how can you know what your book says unless you've had someone like a scholar who's dedicated his life opening the meaning and then we're here just to receive it. You know, it's, it's such a miracle. So, um, Thank you for giving me all of this time um, to take you through some history and my, my musings and kind of go off on my convert zeal. I really appreciate it. Um, but I, again, please join this cause. Let's make a difference. Let's get to that tipping point. Let's get this book to everyone. We can you know, get, get it to, um, if you know people who can write reviews, if you know people who want to endorse it, um, you know anyone, like there are just a million ways. Let's get it into the hands of politicians. Um, interfaith groups, um, you know, Muslim artists. I'm going to reach out to Rami. I'm going to say, Rami, get this to all of your friends. You know, everybody who wants to care about Islam, who wants to be Muslim, wants to find 
um, comfort and faith and direction and, and justice and, and, and something much better than this, this darkness in this world. This is the way, so let's, let's do it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much.